I begin today's sermon with a quote that seems to be somewhat common in Christian circles. Not sure where the credit belongs, but here it is. Someone somewhere is depending on you to do what God has called you to do. I'll say that again, and I'm going to say it several times. Someone, somewhere, is depending on you to do what God has called you to do. The sentiment certainly lines up with the biblical text in many ways. Jeremiah 29, 11 reads, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future, supporting the notion that God can indeed have particular plans for our lives, just as he did for Jeremiah. Then there's Isaiah 6 and 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. Supporting the belief that God does indeed call people to do what God wants done. And as Isaiah does, people answer and people respond to the call. There's also, also Matthew 4, 19, when Jesus says to the disciples, follow me and I will make you fishers of men, fishers of humanity, supporting the notion that God can use our profession and our skills. They were fishermen that we use for our livelihood. God can use those for the work that God has for us to do. And then there are times that we ourselves are compelled to serve because of the grace of God on our lives. Like 1 Corinthians 3.10, the Apostle Paul says, because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it. There are also times when our unique gifts can be used by God, as Proverbs 18.16 reminds us that our gifts make room for us and bring us before great places and great people, no doubt, to do God's work in high places. Time after time after time, the biblical text assures us that there is indeed purpose. Whoever wrote that on the card didn't put the name, but you're in the right place on today. There is indeed purpose for our lives. God blesses us with gifts and talents, even treasures. God calls us and affirms us and uses us for God's work, for good work, sometimes for good trouble, always for purposes God has ordained in God's kingdom where love is the guiding principle. So while I can't credit anyone in particular for the quote, it certainly lines up with the biblical text with God's divine ways that someone somewhere is depending on you to do what God has called you to do. These are words that speak to purpose. Have you ever wondered about your purpose? And whether there's a unique purpose for your life? As reported just two years ago, Rick Warren's best-selling book, A Purpose Driven Life, sold over 50 million copies in over 130 languages. People were hungry and are hungry for purpose in their lives, and they and we bought that book in droves, opened the first page, and at least 50 million people in 130 languages read these first four words. It's not about you. 
Doesn't that sound divine? That God would create us such that we're hungry to understand our purpose, and the first thing we need to learn is it's not about us. Certainly lines up with Jesus' life of purpose. As a pastor, part of and primary to my job is to continuously think about the purpose of the church. And the church is not the building. The building is a tool of the church. And it was during the pandemic that this became clearer to some of us that the church is the people, for we could not enter the building, but we still had church. Amen? We still had one another. We could not enter the building, yet we still worshiped together. We split up the phone list and called each other to check on one another, and we helped people among us with technical support to be able to connect on Sundays for online worship, or we invited them into our homes if we knew they were struggling to connect to the internet. We grieved the loss of loved ones together, including very dear members and even staff, a staff member of our church, we encouraged one another. We considered what was happening in the world together. We studied anti-racism together in the wake of George Floyd's video recorded murder. We made and picked up and dropped off masks to one another. Some of us purchased food or cooked food for others. And when we could enter the church under social distancing guidelines, we opened this beautiful sanctuary and then the social hall to the food pantry. There was nothing more beautiful than seeing bags of food Fill the pews, making it possible for the food pantry to continue. It's serving the community, and that need grew and grew and is still growing. We were not trying to do it without the building. Due to the pandemic, we had to do it without the building. And High Park Union Church, we did it well, for we, each and every one of us, collectively are the church. Hear me clearly. We thank God for the edifice. We thank God for this building. We thank God for the church. Am I alone? Do we thank God for this edifice? Come on, let's give God praise for this a beautiful, amazing edifice. But we are the church. We care about and want to take care of this edifice, but we are the church. For if we were not the church, we would have ceased connecting and worshiping and caring for one another until the governor or mayor said we could. But praise God, we kept going. We actually didn't miss a beat. For we are the body of Christ. We are the church. Our purpose over those years became clear to care about our neighbor. Our purpose became clear to seek God, to love God and to love our neighbor. Some of us prayed more during the pandemic than we've prayed in our lives. We stayed together and we made adjustments and made it work and we wondered and read and discussed how to be the church God called us to be. The pandemic was challenging as challenging as it was, it gave us opportunity to be the church. Now let me be clear, there are always opportunities to be the church. There are always opportunities to love the Lord our God and to love our neighbors as ourselves. There are always opportunities to do what Jesus said in Matthew 25, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit those who are in prison and welcome the stranger. There are always opportunities to speak truth to power and to tear down and to build up. There are always opportunities to offer love and charity to those in need and to do justice love, mercy, and walk 
humbly with our God, but, but sometimes those opportunities are more intense than other times. And the times begin to call us out to be the church. There are those times that call and compel us to stand up and step up and be the church. And we did it during the pandemic. And we are once again in those times. There are the ongoing impact of the pandemic impacting people mentally, physically, and spiritually. There is a war in Ukraine, migrants from Venezuela and from Haiti and surely other lands, people seeking to survive, seeking a better life. There's war between Israel and Hamas and Palestine, destroying lives and everything in sight. There's the daily violence, poverty, hunger, loneliness, and homelessness, and all of this is calling us out individually and collectively, saying someone, somewhere, is waiting on us to do what God has called us to do. How do I know that, that God has called the church to do anything? Well, let me introduce you to the first letter of Paul to the Thessalonians. Listen to this. First Thessalonians was written in about 50 CE. We're in CE now, so 50 CE. Approximately 20 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And 20 years before the Gospel of Mark was written, it is the oldest existing piece of Christian literature, older than the Gospels. If you don't understand that, we can talk about it later. But it is the oldest existing piece of Christian literature, part of the Christian journey. Before writing the letter, Paul visited Thessalonica along with Silvanus and Timothy, preached and taught and fellowshiped with the people, Jewish and Gentile converts to Christianity. Later, Timothy returned, gave a report to Paul on his visit, and Paul wrote this letter to the church, the Christians at Thessalonica. And listen to what Paul says in the oldest piece of Christian literature, older than the Gospels. Listen to what Paul says to the Christians at Thessalonica. We always give thanks, verse 2, to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers constantly, remembering before our God your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul helps us by describing in his letter the early church in the oldest Christian document available to us that the purpose of the gathered Christians, that is the church, is the work of faith, the labor of love and the steadfastness of hope. During the pandemic, we saw among us the work of faith. We saw a labor of love and we saw the steadfastness of hope. We were that for one another and for those in the community. We, we, I see regularly, even now among us, High Park Union, the work of faith the labor of love and the steadfastness of hope. And with all that's going on right now, the church, capital C, which includes us in all churches, are being called to offer to a suffering world the work of faith, a labor of love, and to have the steadfastness of hope. Somebody's got to have hope for when we understand our purpose. We understand Rick Warren's first four words, it's not about us. How do we do this? Well, Paul helps us again in verse 6 when he says that the people, the Christians, the church of Thessalonica became imitators of the Lord. 
And in spite of persecution, it's right there in your text, they became an example to all believers. The earliest Christian text is teaching us about the purpose of the church, and that is to be imitators of the Lord. And we know that Paul later begins to call the church the body of Christ. It makes sense, right? If we're the imitator of Christ, then we are the body of Christ. We are the hands and the feet and the mouthpiece of Jesus. Pastor Sarah and I were talking about this this week. In more contemporary times, someone came up with the catchy question, what would Jesus do, WWJD? Imitators of the Lord the body of Christ, the hands and feet and mouth of Jesus, WWJD, all ways to understand the purpose of the church in our community and in our world. And someone, somewhere, is waiting and depending on us to do what God has called us to do. Today, the Holy Spirit inspired me to use Psalm 27 to bring this home. For, for the trouble we are seeing in our community and in our world today, it sounds like the psalmist, believed to be David, could have wrote this in our time. So my question is, can the church, big C and little c, can the church be the church for the psalmist? of Psalm 27. For the psalmist of Psalm 27 seems to be in some of the same trouble that many in our community and in our world find themselves today. So as we read Psalm 27, the question is how can the church, Big C and Little C, Hyde Park Union Church, be the church? How can we be imitators of Christ? And what would Jesus do when hearing the words and the cries of the psalmist. So listen to the first three verses through that lens. The psalmist says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of the stronghold of my life. Some translations say the Lord is the refuge of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid when evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp around me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. In just verse 1, and I read through 3, but just in verse 1, if the church was serving the psalmist, imitating Christ, the church would be a light and a savior and a refuge for the psalmist in their time of fear. Church, right here in our community, we have the opportunity to be the church. Someone needs us to be a light in darkness. Someone needs to be saved from that which is causing them fear. Someone, some whole families need refuge. People are in need of relationship with people of God in this time in their lives. Somebody who has hope. And someone somewhere is depending on us to do what God has called us to do. The psalmist continues, listen to this, and he says, One thing I desire of the Lord, and this I seek, I'm looking for it, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. The person is in distress and wants to enter the temple. And our role is to offer an extravagant welcome. 
Can the church, big C and little c, be open and accessible? For that's the one thing some people need right now. Can, can we represent the beauty of the Lord? Open House Chicago, people came and continue to come each year, and they behold our beauty. And no doubt some of them pray when they're in this space. I am sure they feel God's presence. How much more for someone who has left home and family all seeking a better life? Can we open the sanctuary so they can inquire in the temple? Can we offer an extravagant welcome so that hurting people can behold the beauty of the Lord? Not, all, not only in the sanctuary, but the beauty they encounter in us. The psalmist says in verse 5, and we the church are trying to see if we can serve the psalmist, he says, for he will hide me in his shelter. In the day of trouble, he will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. People are literally in need of shelter. Houses of worship across this city are being asked, we've been asked multiple times, can you provide shelter? We are in the process of asking ourselves, is there any way we can heed that call effectively? And if we cannot, can we partner with a church who can? For someone somewhere is depending on us to do what God has called us to do. And then the psalmist says, now, after he's gotten the shelter and some of those basic needs, some of us know about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, some of those basic needs of the psalmist has been met. And the psalmist says, now, my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices of shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. And then he says, hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. We're imitators of Christ. And someone somewhere is depending on the church to hear their cry and not hide from them. Listen to his words. Verse 8, he says, come, my heart. He's encouraging himself. Seek God's face. Your face, Lord, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger, you who have been my help. Do not cast me off. Don't forsake me, O oh God, of my salvation. If my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. The psalmist pleads with the Lord to not turn them away, to not cast them off. And someone somewhere is depending on us to do what God has called us to do. Verse 11, which is on the front of your bulletin, teach me your ways, O oh God. Lead me on a level path because of my enemies. This is my prayer for our church. Not just our church, for the big C, capital church, church universal. Because in these times, and it seems in all times, there are what seem to be insurmountable challenges. And if not the church, then who? I know this sermon is challenging. It's challenging us to do more to imitate Christ. To do more for those who are crying out to do more for those who are hurting, more for those who need shelter. And we can't do everything, but we can do something. Ooh, I prayed I'd get an amen right there. We can't do everything, but we can do something. Amen. Thank you. Not by myself. Because just like the psalmist closes, 
Someone within our reach is saying, I believe. I believe in you. He says, I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord. I'll, I'll see some of those imitating Christ. I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, not when I get to glory, but right here on earth in Chicago, in Hyde Park, I believe I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And then verse 14, and they're waiting and says, wait for the Lord. Wait for the church. Wait for the imitators of Christ. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. The Thessalonians text also ends with wait on the Lord. God must have known that the church is going to take a little bit of time, but it's okay. God is inspiring us divinely to step up. But he tells those who need us to just, just give them a minute. Just wait on the Lord. People are indeed waiting. Someone somewhere is waiting on me. Someone somewhere is waiting on you. Someone somewhere is waiting on us to do what God has called us to do. And the wonderfully miraculous thing about God is that when we realize our purpose, that it's not about us. When we imitate Christ and we focus on being the church, being light and salvation and shelter for those in trouble, when we don't turn them away, and don't hear their cries when we offer extravagant welcome and allow those who are hurting to inquire in the temple. When we fulfill God's purpose for our lives and for the church, here's what I know for sure, and it's found in Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply all of our needs according to God's riches and glory. And sometimes we spend time working on our needs when we need to be caring and imitating Christ and let God take care of our needs. Someone, somewhere, is waiting for us to do what God has called us to do. And maybe, just maybe, that someone is God. God bless you.